this video, I want to take a look at ShopCo, which is a chain of department stores that operates in the Midwest and western parts of the United States. ShopCo has been facing some financial problems lately and might even be preparing to uh, file for bankruptcy. They just announced, you know, a store closing list and things are only going to get worse for ShopCo. In this video, I want to take a look at their history, how they got here, and look at one of their stores to see, you know, what their store conditions look like. According to the ShopCo history page on their website, ShopCo was founded in 1962 by pharmacist James Rubin. When Rubin opened his first ShopCo store in Green Bay in 1962, he envisioned a company focused on quality, convenience, and value. He saw the opportunity to combine healthcare services with a large discount store. And in 1971, ShopCo became one of the first mass retailers to feature a pharmacy in its stores. In another innovative step, ShopCo added optical care centers to its stores in 1978. Today, ShopCo is known for its excellence in optical care and its best-in-class pharmacy services. That pretty much was just the corporate summary of ShopCo's history, but right now we're going to uh, dive into ShopCo's deeper history. James Rubin was an executive of a pharmacy company down in Chicago. He'd worked as a pharmacist at Walgreens before that. Eventually, he decided he wanted to found his own chain of stores. He settled that Green Bay, Wisconsin would be a good market to start his stores in. So that's why in 1962, ShopCo was founded. The first ShopCo store opened in 1962 in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Rubin recognized the potential to serve smaller markets which often had been ignored by the big discount store chains at that time. They were, you know, originally targeted male customers, and by 1969, they had five stores in Wisconsin and Michigan. And in a decade, they already had sales of $41 million annually. In 1971, they were purchased by Super Value, who then came up with the idea of combining with the pharmacy. Around that time, they started to, you know, shift into the soft good category with adding stuff like clothes and, like, home stuff. In 1978, they became one of the first discount stores to add optical departments into their stores, uh, full service also. With no competition pretty much in anywhere they were, they grew from $41 million in sales in 1971 to $135 million in 1978 and reached $335 million in 1982 with only about 36 stores. ShopCo was catching on like wildfire in the areas they were operating in. ShopCo continued to expand through the 1980s, even reaching as far west as Idaho in 1986. In 1988, they had 87 stores and were one of the fastest growing discounters at that time, and revenue was reaching $1 billion. However, through this time, a slew of new competitors were growing and expanding. Kmart, Target, and Walmart were all growing, and they were starting to eat into ShopCo's territory. ShopCo eventually determined in the early 90s that they just really could not beat Walmart in price and needed to turn the store in a different direction, and so they launched Vision 2000. They would automate, you know, distribution and inventory, enhance health services under this plan. Then they would remodel every single store to eliminate clutter, have an open uh, floor plan, a brighter color scheme, hassle-free returns, and no fee layaways. Shopco essentially wanted to, you know, like, be the anti-Walmart. They wanted to focus in on Walmart's weaker categories like clothing and seasonal stuff and put less focus on Walmart's stronger categories like groceries and uh, sporting goods. In part to this strategy, ShopCo was able to do well as many regional discount stores uh, faced troubles. In 1999, ShopCo purchased Pomita, which was a chain of 148 small town discount stores, which the CEO of ShopCo, William Potany at the time, described as a 20th century version of the general store with everything from milk to
to f hunting to fishing gear. The issue with that is this was 1999, and they were still in the 20th century at that time. But in about a year later, they would be in the 21st century, where the problems would only begin. In 2000, as Shopco was continuing to aggressively grow its Pamita chain, it encountered some issues. It uh, ran into some debt, 840 million of it, some distribution issues as they were growing. And then in January of 2001, to try to you know restructure the company, they had to close 23 stores in a distribution center. That was the first store closing wave they've ever done. Shopco continued to decline for a few more years, but no fear, private equity is here, because in 2005, Shopco was purchased by the private equity firm Sun Capital Partners via a leveraged buyout. Just to make a note, it was a leveraged buyout that killed Toys R Us. I don't want to even try to explain a leveraged buyout because it's pretty complicated, but there, there's a lot of pros and cons to them. In 2007, Shopco changed their logo to their current logo, and they adapted a new beige and black color scheme for all their stores. Pretty much all the outsides of their stores were repainted around this time as well. In 2007, they also sold off their Pamita chain, which I just learned I have been pronouncing it wrong. It's actually pronounced Pamita. Boys and girls sizes too. Shop Pamita because paying less feels great. Through those years following the 2007 uh, spinoff of Pamita, Shopco really didn't change all that much. In 2010, though, they launched Shopco Hometown, which essentially was a Pamita store, but with the Shopco name on it. In 2011, Shopco continued to expand the Shopco hometown chain, and then in 2012, they merged with Pomida again, and they rebranded all the Pomida stores to the Shopco hometown name. Shopco continued to expand Shopco hometown over the next few years through some small acquisitions here and there. In 2016, the CEO of Shopco, Peter McMahon, said that their future is extending into these underserved markets like rural areas with their smaller big box stores and fulfilling the needs of small town America. The article said that they could open up about 40 of these stores every year and saying the country could support about 2,000 of them. He also, the a big quote from the article was like, the rural population is grossly underserved by retailers. However, in 2017, Shopco did not follow that aggressive expansion uh, strategy and only opened one store. Because Shopco is privately owned, they don't really reveal very much about their finances. So this all correlates to in early December 2018, they would be shutting down 38 stores in 19 states. Then about a week later, they announced they would be getting out of the pharmacy business and selling their pharmacies to, you know, grocery stores like Kroger and Hy-Vee. Bloomberg also reported that their owner, Sun Capital Partners, remember they're still in play here, was uh, trying to sell them and they were unsuccessful. So now they were looking into declaring bankruptcy. That is pretty much where you're at now. Right now, we are uh, looking at a map of all the Shopco locations in the wonderful United States. They operate about 360 stores, about as far west as Oregon, and as far east as Ohio, as far south as Texas, and as far north as northern Minnesota. Their stores are very spread out, and they could arguably consider a, almost, or they are almost a national chain. They operate stores under four different concepts, you could say. They have the hometown stores, which are, I have marked in the green, the full line stores marked in the black, the express stores, which are essentially just standalone pharmacies marked in the uh, orange, and standalone optical stores, which I have marked in the brown. All the standalone optical stores, there's only two of them, they've uh, opened in the last couple weeks. They've or last couple of months. These are, are kind of their new expansion method. Their headquarters are in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Speaking of Wisconsin, Wisconsin is their home market, as you can see. This is where I mentioned in the press section they were originally founded. 
but interestingly, they do not operate in Wisconsin's largest market, Milwaukee. There are no Shopco stores in the Milwaukee metro area, unless you consider Sussex, Wisconsin, and part of the Milwaukee metro area, but it's barely, let's just say that. They don't really have much of a presence here, and that's really how they are with a lot of major cities. Chicago, they don't have any presence. Minneapolis, even though it's right in their distribution network. I think it's because they don't want to compete and get into a situation where they have to compete with these urban companies. They like to have things all to their own, even though Walmart and Target are in many of these smaller markets. They're, Madison, they have three stores. Appleton, they have like five or six. Green Bay, they have a bunch too. That's where they're headquartered at. Uh, La Crosse, Eau Claire... Like, they like those medium-sized cities for their full-line stores. They don't like to operate in the big cities with them. The largest metro I think they operate in is Salt Lake City. They have five stores there. Even then, that's not the largest place. In the Pacific Northwest, they, again, follow the same strategy. In Iowa and the Midwest, they've been really aggressively opening these hometown stores, as you might have learned in the past section. All the hometown stores have opened since 2010. Each one of those green dots represents a store they had to spend a ton of money on remodeling and refurbishing or building. They got into probably, they're probably in some debt from that. And I think that is what's weighing them down. They may have just overexpanded way too quickly. A sign of overexpansion is when they open two stores extremely close to each other in a place that doesn't need two stores extremely close to each other. This is my example of that. These both are, one was I think a conversion, but this one opened like two years after this one was already a Shopco hometown. It makes zero sense to have two stores in a small town. Wouldn't it make more sense to have one super profitable store than two semi-profitable stores? I just don't get it. It's kind of dumb. Up here you have two stores that are a little closer than others. I get it though. It's about 25 minute drive between the two. I think it's just a sign of over expansion. Them closing uh, those 38 stores, I think, were, most of those were hometown stores because they simply just over expanded with it. When Shopco really went into these rural areas, they found themselves stuck in the middle. Pretty much all the small towns, they feature a store like a tractor supply company or barm guards that sells like clothes, farming tools, and like farm equipment, and like farm supplies and stuff. Then they would also have to face Dollar General, which still beats them on many prices. And then they'd still have to compete with Amazon, the force that is Amazon is still very hard to compete with no matter where you go. That's still true in small towns. And then you still have small town grocery stores, whether it be like, you know, a local chain, like a, like a mom and pop store, or a chain like Fairway. Only 19% of the U.S. population lives in uh, rural areas, and that population tends to be poor and have less money than people in urban areas because there's just simply less jobs. That means people there don't have the money to spend on things, and Shopco Hometown tends to be significantly more expensive than, like, Walmart in these small towns. And when there's, like, a Walmart, you know, like, a half hour away, it's like, I'll just drive to Walmart maybe once a week and get my shopping done there, and maybe if I have to get one or two items, I'll just go to Shopco Hometown. All of that is really just my opinion, though. I, I've only been into a Shopco hometown once. I'm just not really that familiar with them. Right now, though, we are going to take a look at a full-line Shopco store. This is the location in Belvedere, Illinois. It opened in the 90s, and the only reason it is I picked it to be featured here is because it is the closest one to my house. This was filmed on a Sunday during the holiday shopping season and the store was moderately busy. The store was very bright and the clothing department was well organized. The signs with like the department names on them were also recently updated.
I poked around the men's department and they did actually have some name brands here. My opinion, the clothing department is significantly better than Walmart's. They also have a full service pay less shoe store here. All full line shop stores have them. The toy department looked a little bit sparse during the holidays. Shopco has their own shoe department while there is a pay less in the same store. These center aisles look quite disheveled, a bit of a mess, just cluttered up. The electronics department here pretty much is a time warp to the 1990s. By having most of the TVs off, they are really convincing me to buy a TV. I don't know what about these teddy bears like creep me out, but they're creepy. actually had a really large luggage department. I still don't get why stores need a ginormous luggage department. I just don't get it. The whole home department was disorganized and a bit of a mess. The as seen on TV section, there's always some like weird and interesting stuff over here. Right here is the uh, Wonder Bible. This is uh, meant to take the Bible on th the go. I uh, find this a little interesting because I just have the Bible app on my phone. Why would I need to pay $40 to get this thing that I could just get on my phone or computer? Doesn't make much sense. Then they have a small selection of, you know, some, like, lights to put in special places. And then they have, you know, the pillows that you swipe, and then they, like, change colors. And they even have wallet versions of them. As seen on TV sections are quite interesting. Welcome to the grocery department. This was only added in 2017, and I'm kind of stunned by that. Some of these tags look like they've been baked on here. I think they have a very low turnover rate over here in the grocery department. Uh, it didn't seem all that busy, and the shelves were very stocked. Look at this Jello uh, that expires February 2019. It, I'm, I'm, that's a little questionable because Jello normally like it takes a long time for it to expire. It really never expires, but. It's still kind of like, huh, this has been sitting here for probably at least two years. This is a great time warp to the 1990s. As you can see, the Shopco Full Line store was very 90s looking. 
In 2016, the CEO of Shopco, Peter McMahon, said the whole industry is seeing a reduction in big box locations. That is a very true statement. Look at Kmart, Toys R Us, and Sears. But at the same time, you know, their competition, Walmart and Target, were aggressively remodeling and refreshing their stores. Then there is Meyer, which is actually expanding and opening new stores, and they're even going into Wisconsin, which was traditionally Shopco's home territory. The full line stores are still a very large part of their business, and there are actually 126 of them, just like the one we just saw. Then there is Shopco's ownership, Sun Capital Partners, who are currently looking to sell them. They own a wide portfolio of companies that include Boston Market, Vince, and Clear Choice. According to their About page on their website, they describe themselves as Sun Capital Partners Inc. is a global private equity firm focused on identifying companies' untapped potential and leveraging its deep operational and financial resources to transform results. Essentially, it's just a bunch of corporate. Eh. They, they, they have a few notable failures in their portfolio, though, that include Gordman's, Marsh, and The Limited. On their website, they also mention that they have invested in 365 companies worldwide with revenues of approximately $50 billion across a broad range of industries and transaction structures. This is a really big company, essentially. When I was working on this video, I read an article about uh, Marsh Supermarkets and essentially about how Sun Capital Partners is not paying pensions out to... Uh, warehouse workers, which is horrible. In the article, it mentions some interesting details like how Sun Collect Capital collected a $1 million annual management fee from Marsh, and then they collected large commissions off selling assets. And this was at the same time because this was a leveraged buyout right here. They were, they were paying back the leveraged buyout. They were just being piled into more and more debt. I'm afraid that kind of stuff could be potentially happening at Shopco right now. I think that there are three options for Shopco moving forward. Option one is that they're just sold and that's it. They're sold and I don't know what's going to happen. Option two is Sun Capital keeps taking parts away. So essentially Sun Capital just keeps closing stores until there's nothing left. Option three is they are pushed into bankruptcy and then what happens is I don't know. They could be sold. They could be completely liquidated. Look at Gorman's. They were able to survive bankruptcy. Bankruptcy does not always mean death for a company. But I don't really know. That's all my speculation. If Shopco Hometown goes out, it would hurt a lot of the small towns that they are located in. Shopco Hometown provides a service and for a lot of these places where there's just nothing for miles, Shopco is one of the few places to actually get clothes that are decent or like not go to the dollar store i do think there is some value in shopco they are making about three billion a year that's no small company right there i talked to many relatives actually and they all like shopco their merchandise is not that bad they have a decent selection of merchandise it's just that the stores all look tired and are all like begging for a remodel I do think Shopco could survive, they just need to reinvent themselves again. Thank you so much for watching this video, this is one of the hardest I've worked on any other video, so I really hope that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to you know, see some of the sources that I used, or just for some further reading, you should uh, check out the description where I will be leaving all of that stuff. If you'd like to, you know, help support me, you should leave a like on this video. That'd be really awesome. If you'd like to, you know, share your thoughts about this video, there's a comment section right there, down below, for you. Then, if you really want to be, like, a super awesome, amazing, amazing person, you should think about subscribing. Subscribing is an easy, easy thing that you could do. It only takes a few seconds. And then, maybe you could click one of these videos on the screen now. One is a half hour and one is not a half hour. Choose which one you want to watch.